Listen, he says, when two or more get together, there he is in the midst. And that's all we need in this place today because we need to saturate the sanctuary with him, his glory, his love. So we just call on his name right now. Come Yahweh, we love you. Be pleased. We welcome those on Facebook Live and we welcome those in the sanctuary. God is good. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. You're God in this place. You're Lord in this place. Hallelujah. 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 And so we decree and declare this is your word. Hallelujah. Let's do our Bible confession. We want to encourage people to bring their Bibles and use it. So we make a Bible confession this morning. If you have your Bible in your phone or wherever you have it, hold it up. This is my Bible. I read it every day with the Holy Ghost as my teacher. It is the voice of God to me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's Word will never pass away. Obeying God's Word is proof of my love for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Today our message is, follow the ark. And we're doing part one today. So let's stay in for the reading of the word, Joshua 3, 1 to 5. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Joshua 3, 1 to 5. And Joshua rose early in the morning. And they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. I'll wait to pause a second for those who are searching for their place to find it. Joshua. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Joshua chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. When you find it, say amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. amen. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass, after three days, that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet, there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So a quick background, you see the pictures on the screen, there are pictures of the Ark, you can sit, you can be seated, the pictures of the Ark of the Covenant, this is what the people had to carry with them, and I want you to notice that it has um, staves right mm. Don't know how to use this well. But right there. <laughs> right there we see the poles. It's not moving like I want it to. Um, right there we see the poles. That's how they carried it. This is the Ark of the Covenant. And what does the Ark of the Covenant represent? Well, if you notice, one of the, the three of the things that will be inside of the Ark... Um, if we go to Hebrews 9, 4, we'll see what it is. The ark represented God's presence. And that's what we were carrying today, bringing his presence in this place as we worship him. 
Hebrews 9, 4 says, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. So we see, if you look inside of the ark, you're going to see the manna, the golden pot in there. I will try to point to it, but my pointer is not working like it should. There, there's the manna. Does that show? And then it represents now the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. That he said, come freely and eat. And then Aaron's rod, that when he threw it down, it budded. That's also represented in the ark. And it represents God's authority. It represents his government, his rule. Amen? Amen. And then we have the third part is the two tablets of the law. This is what Moses went up into the mount and received from God that God himself wrote with his finger. And this represents the word, not only the law, the word that governs everything. And we've got to remember the word. Jesus was the word made flesh. So these things in the ark are important. And then above it, you have the cherubs. And that's God's angelic host. They're his servants. And they're there to do his bidding. And we see above the, on the ark the two cherubs facing each other with their wings touching. And it represents God's power in the earth that he's given to us. So all of these pieces in the ark at that time was available to us. And so we come to Joshua chapter 3. Let's look at Joshua chapter 3. Today I'm going to bring three points. Joshua chapter 3 verse 5. We'll start with the last. Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. For tomorrow... The Lord will do wonders among you. And there was a condition. God is restored. The first point I want to make today is God is restoring his awe. He's restoring his glory again to his bride, to the sanctuary with signs and miracles following. But there was a condition we see in Joshua 3, 5. There is a condition, and I'm sure you picked it up. It said, sanctify yourselves. Sanctify yourselves. And that word sanctified, people make it complicated. But it simply means, it's a Hebrew word, kadash. And it simply means consecrate, set yourself apart, purify yourself. In those days, some of the ways they set themselves apart was to clean their clothes because they didn't change clothes as often as we did. They didn't have all the wardrobe that we did. So they had to make sure their clothes was washed and clean. They had to clean themselves. And one of the things husbands and wives agreed to do was not come together sexually that night. I want to make an aside on this. First Corinthians chapter 7 tells us that when a husband and wife plans to consecrate themselves by not having sex, it says be careful to come together quickly so Satan doesn't tempt you. So it must be agreed upon. Both husband and wife must agree with it. If husband doesn't agree, then you don't do it. Husband and wife agree not to have sex. And then you quickly come together again so that Satan doesn't tempt you for adultery. How do we sanctify ourselves in this day? Same ways, but it's more an inner heart thing. What are we watching? What are we doing? 
We take that time to set it apart and to turn our hearts to the Lord. So the condition for God restoring his awe, his wonder, is to sanctify ourselves. Jesus himself said in John chapter 17, verse 17, that last sermon that he had with his disciples, the last big prayer before his death. He says, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So the biggest way that we need to sanctify ourselves again in this hour is turn back to the word of God. A lot of us has made the word something that is optional, but to sanctify ourselves, it's not optional. The word sanctifies us because it's Jesus himself, it's God himself, it's the truth. So our first point today we want to make is that God is restoring his awe for him, his awe for his word, so that signs and miracles will follow. And we need to sanctify ourselves. Amen? The second point I want to make today comes from Joshua 3.3. 3. Let's read it. Joshua 3.3. 3. And they commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God, and the priests bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. The first point, the second point that I want to make, and the first from this particular scripture is this. God's due order is being restored to the house. This is point number two. I have one there, and there's a reason God changed the order of this message. And when I was fixing the order, I forgot to put number two on this one. He got me up and changed the order, and he's in charge. If you look at the pictures on the screen, you see a way to carry the ark. It had to be through those four poles that were through rings attached to the ark, and it had to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. But there were special priests who carried the ark, now, the high priest Aaron at that time had three sons, and they all were in charge of the things of God, but his son Kohath and his children were the ones who had to carry the ark on their shoulders. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in Numbers chapter 7 where Moses got 12, 12 oxen and some wagons and six wagons and he gave four of the wagons and eight of the oxen to the priesthood but it says in Numbers chapter 7 verse 9 to the sons of Kohat he gave none because the service of the sanctuary belonging to them was that they should bear the ark upon their shoulders so they didn't have oxen and they didn't have carts to carry their stuff in. They had to, the son of Aaron, Kohath, and his children had to pack the ark up carefully, lovingly, and carry it on their backs. And something interesting I discovered as I was studying last night, well, yesterday, finishing up on this message from awakening, churchawakening.com, it says, these things were originally designed by God, as you see with the golden rings on the side, so that the gold-covered acacia poles could be slipped through with the rings, and they had to carry it on their shoulder, and listen, because we are now priests and kings when we come to Jesus, so this is for us too. We carry the presence of God. They had to carry it on their shoulders for several reasons. Because it was sacred and holy and set apart. The ark 
was sacred, holy, and set apart. And remember, the ark is the presence of God. And so when they carry it on their shoulder, they're doing so because of the fear of the Lord. It was his command that they do it this way. They carry it out of love and respect for God. They carry it close to their nostrils. Because when they have it on their, on their shoulders, they can smell the residue of all the holy things they had done with the ark before they packed it up. Because remember, they sacrificed, they burnt their sacrifice with the oil and the, the fire on the altar so they could smell it still, the oil from the lamps. They could smell fresh bread because fresh bread had to be put in that ark. They could smell the fresh bread. They could smell the incense from the worship. And so we're supposed to carry the presence of the Lord that smell hearing his heartbeat the sound the resonance of his voice so I want to ask a question today are we using common wagons and oxen today in our personal lives to carry Jesus or are we carefully and respectfully and fearfully carrying it on our shoulders as he ordered. God's due order is being restored to the church again, the way he wants it done. And then the, 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 the third point and last point, and you see it's still two on my screen because like I said, God changed it. And in my haste to make it the way he wanted, I forgot to change the numbers. So this is the third point I want to make, and it comes from Joshua 3.3 3 still. It says that as they carry it on their shoulders, let's look at Joshua 3.3 3 again. In Joshua 3.3, 3, it says, And they commanded the people, saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. You should remove when you see it. When you see it being carried, not by any old person. Sadly, some people are using the word of God for their own benefit. And you see a lot of them are being indicted so, when we see it, follow it. So it's on the shoulders. It's carried by the right people. The people who've sanctified themselves. Because those priests had to be specially sanctified. So the presence, the art of the Lord is obvious. It's not hidden. It's there for the world to see. Psalm 19, 1 to 4. Psalm 19, 1 to 4 says, Psalm 19, 1 to 4, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. There is no speech. There is no language. Where the voice of the elements do not utter. That God is God. That God is holy. That God is real. So in the end, when we stand before him, we'll have no excuse. Because it's obvious for all to see. 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4. It says, If our gospel is hid, it is only hid from those who are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, whose image of God should shine unto them. And that's what we need to pray 
for our loved ones. That God, the God of heaven and earth, the God, the creator, will cause the God of this world to remove the blinders from the minds of our loved ones so they can see before it's too late. Amen? Amen. In Romans 1.20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. There is no excuse. And when we stand before Him in the day, Matthew 7 tells us, there will be no excuse. We ought to know him and are known by him or we're going to hear from him depart from me. So I want to encourage you today as we come to the end of our message hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus and we're not going to move to the next point, because this is for part two. It says, God's presence is for all to clearly see and follow. And so I'm calling this church to 14 days of sanctification and prayer from September the 20th to October the 3rd. Amen. September 20th to October the 3rd to set aside ourselves. You know how. God will show you how tonight. How to set yourself aside. Whatever it is he calls you to do. Whether it's a fast meal or to fast certain TV shows or whatever. He's going to show you how to set yourself aside. And we're joining with many people around the, the nation, even around the world, the prayer started seven days ago. We're coming in on the last 14 days. Just praying for our country. Just praying. So as we come to the end of our message today, I want to encourage you. Submit yourself to him. And make yourself ready for him. Because we don't know at which, at which day, at which hour he'll come. Revelation 19, 7 says there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, yes. We are his bride and he's the groom. And there's going to come a day when there's going to be a beautiful wedding supper. And the Bible says his bride has made herself ready. So he's given us a chance now to make ourselves ready. And so I want to encourage an altar call that you come, come to the altar of God in your hearts. Come, come to Christ, the son of the living God, God himself, master, creator of the universe. Come, just come to the one who loves you best. How have you stepped back from serving him? How have you put everything even in this day, ahead of him. So this is a call to come back, back to the one who loves you best. Hallelujah. We're going to listen to this song. And as we listen to it, God specifically had me up several times listening. He wanted this song and he had it over and over and over until I finally got up. <laughs> 